This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the last chapter of the series, Swan Songs, where I share true crime cases that inspired songs. In this episode, we're going back to the 1940s to hear a case that caused quite a sensation at that time. This story had it all. Sex, money, a gruesome murder, and a beautiful femme fatale. The public was both scandalized and titillated by this shocking crime and followed every twist and turn of this story closely. And there were many. This is the case of the infamous Evelyn Dick and the torso murder of 1946. On Saturday, March 16, 1946, a group of children decided to get together for a little exploring and a picnic on Hamilton Mountain. They were headed to Albion Falls, located on the hilly area just a few miles outside the city of Hamilton in Ontario, Canada. David Reed, age 11, and his little sister Faith, age 8, were making the trek with their neighbors, the Weaver Boys, Jimmy, the oldest at 12, Robert, 10, and Fred Weaver, 9. The kids were horsing around on their way up when Jimmy and Robert began fighting over a little telescope they'd brought along. Both boys wanted to use it, and after starting to tussle over it, the bigger boy punched Robert in the nose. Upset, Robert ran off the trail they were on and down a hill, away from his brother. His little brother Fred followed after him. A minute later, Fred and Robert began yelling from the embankment where they were standing. They'd seen something and called the other kids over to look at it. About 20 feet down on an outcropping, they saw what at first appeared to them to be a dead pig. They could see blood and a portion of something wrapped in some type of cloth. The kids began inching their way down the incline, and as soon as they got closer, the gruesome discovery came into focus. It was a human body, but only a portion of one. They discovered that it was missing its head, arms, and legs. They had found a human torso. The children ran up to the road and flagged down an approaching car. Inside was a couple. The car pulled over. When the children told the man what they had found, he was skeptical, but agreed to follow them to take a look. Moments later, he returned to the car with a stricken look on his face. He told the woman to go and call the police while he waited with the children. When police arrived around 11 a.m. that morning, they found the torso partially obscured under some brush. It was resting stomach side down, with the shoulders positioned toward the bottom of the hill. It looked as if it had been pushed straight over the side of the hill from the top, but had gotten caught on the outcropping and stopped there. If it hadn't done so, it would have most likely dropped 200 feet to the bottom of the canyon and never have been discovered. Lowering themselves carefully, investigators took note of the torso. The victim was male, and the only clothing covering the body was a bodysuit type of underwear, like a woman's one-piece bathing suit. The arm and leg portions of the garment had been torn off. There was a large area of blood around the neckline. The head had been completely removed, as had the arms and legs. A photographer was called to the scene to record the condition of the torso and its position. The undertaker then arrived to begin the removal of the body. When the body was turned over, there appeared to be at least one bullet hole through the right side of the chest. There was also a large blood stain made by a deep cut across the stomach. From this, it was concluded that an attempt had been made to cut the torso itself in half. There was no blood on the ground or anywhere in the area, so it was believed that the murder and the dismemberment of the body had been done in another location. On Monday morning, the county pathologist, with the appropriate surname of Deadman, performed a post-mortem examination on the torso. Dr. Dedman described the victim as male, approximately 185 pounds, 5 foot 10 or 5 foot 11, age 40 to 45, and Caucasian. The doctor approximated that the death of the man had occurred 10 to 14 days earlier. The neck had been severed at the area of the larynx with what appeared to be a saw. 
The right arm had been severed four and a half inches below the shoulder by sawing through the bone and then bending it so it splintered in half. The left arm was sawed off completely about seven inches below the shoulder. Both legs had been sawed through. The left leg was removed at about six inches below the hip and the right side about 14 inches below. There was also a cut made across the torso at the area just above the navel. It was deep and had perforated the bowels. This cut looked to have been started and then stopped. When the bowel was punctured, it would have emitted a foul odor. Perhaps this, apart from the rest of the grisly deed, had finally repulsed the victim's mutilator enough to halt them in their tracks. Two gunshot wounds made by the same bullet were found. The bullet had entered the chest in the front and exited at the side. It was a clean through and through wound that had not caused any damage to the ribs or any organs and would not have been fatal. A urine test revealed that the victim had imbibed quite a bit of alcohol. The level was significant enough to conclude that he had been intoxicated at the time of his death. Authorities could only hope that the poor man had been sufficiently numbed to be unaware of his impending doom. What had killed the man could not be determined by the pathologist. He thought it was most likely that the fatal wound, either by a blow, a bullet, or some other means, had occurred to the head to cause the victim's death. Because it was missing, this was simply a theory that could not be proven. However, the pathologist did conclude that it would have taken a person of some strength to dismember the body. Dr. Denman even gave an estimate of how long it would have taken to saw through the limbs and sever the head, at least 30 minutes. Now it was left to the investigators to identify the body and start searching for suspects. As far as the identification, they were immediately in luck. A missing persons report had been filed by two different people that week for a man of about the same size and age. The day before the discovery of the torso, Ray Castle, a supervisor working for the Hamilton Street Railway, called to report one of his employees missing. On March 5th, 10 days earlier, streetcar operator John Dick had been absent from work and had not called his boss to report in. He had not been seen after that day that happened to be Ash Wednesday. On the same day, Dick's cousin, Alex Kammerer, also reported his 39-year-old relative missing. Alex told police that his cousin had been staying with him and his wife, Anne, for about a month. He explained that John Dick and his wife, Evelyn, had separated on February 3rd, and John had moved in with them. It was Alex's understanding that he'd gone to meet his estranged wife on the last day he'd seen him, which was March 6th. Now wondering if they'd found the body of John Dick, investigators sought out a close family member to come and identify the remains. On Tuesday, March 19th, John and Jake Wall, both brothers-in-law of John Dick, arrived at the morgue to attempt to make the identification. John Wall was married to Dick's sister, Anna, and Jake Wall was married to his other sister, Lena. Jake quickly realized that he could not stomach looking at the torso and left the room. John Wall, however, was able to identify it as belonging to his brother-in-law, whom he'd known since they were kids. Investigators heard from several people, including his boss and family members, that John Dick and his 26-year-old wife Evelyn were in the middle of a contentious divorce. They also learned that Evelyn's parents, especially her father, Donald McLean, had strongly disliked her husband and had opposed the marriage. The couple had only been married a few short months before they'd separated. Now investigators knew their next task was to find out all they could about John and Evelyn Dick and their short-lived relationship. John Dick was born in 1906 in Russia. His father had died in the famine in 1921, and just three years later, the family emigrated to Canada. John Dick was 18 years old when they settled in Ontario. His mother, Amelia, two sisters, Lena and Anna, grandmother, Rose Kammerer, and brother-in-law, John Wall, all settled in Vineland. John and Jake Wall became successful fruit farmers, eventually expanding their operation by purchasing a canning factory. John Dick first worked as a farmhand, but quickly grew tired of farming 
and decided to move to the city to seek his fortune. He relocated to the city of Hamilton and made a living driving a truck. In 1943, he was hired by the Hamilton Street Railway as a streetcar operator. John Dick was a confirmed bachelor well into his 30s. Six foot tall and weighing 180 pounds with blonde hair and piercing blue eyes, he had an eye for the ladies but was somewhat shy and his family would say a bit naive. He liked to drink but was considered to be mild-mannered and even gentle. Driving the downtown streetcar line, he got to meet many women who probably considered him a catch. In 1945, he started dating Anna Wolski. Anna was a widow with children whose husband had been a friend of John's. Anna asked John to marry her in the summer of 1945, but he gave the excuse that he was providing financially for his 72-year-old mother and 92-year-old grandmother. Anna, however, didn't give up and asked him again later that month. This time, he gave her a completely different reason why he couldn't marry her. John Dick told her that he was already married. However, this wasn't exactly true. John Dick wouldn't get married until two months later to a raven-haired 24-year-old beauty named Evelyn McLean. Whether John Dick met Evelyn on his streetcar route or in the hotel bars he liked to frequent is unknown. What is known is that within weeks of meeting, the couple had married, and neither Evelyn's family nor John's were made aware of the upcoming nuptials. But Evelyn harbored a lot of secrets, as investigators would soon learn. There's a new podcast I want to tell you about, like one you probably never heard before. Imagine for a moment it's the year 2010. You leave your high-paying job at a blue-chip software company, come home and do the same thing you've done now for weeks. You go to the medicine cabinet, take four or five painkillers from your cancer-stricken wife's never-ending supply, crush them up into a powder, and wash them down with a tumbler of vodka. It didn't used to be this way, and it's about to get much, much worse. This is the story of Robert B., and he tells it on the powerful new podcast, Keep Coming Back. Real Stories of Sobriety and Recovery. Each week, host Mike S. interviews and unravels stories of people who fell down and have managed to get back up again. There's Harrison, tried moderating his drinking, only to wake up in a jail cell. Or Sydney, today a successful nurse practitioner, but formerly a heroin addict, who first went into rehab at 15 years old. The show again is called Keep Coming Back. Real Stories of Sobriety and Recovery. Subscribe and listen. A link to the show is in today's notes. I know you'll be intrigued. Evelyn McLean was born on October 13, 1920, in Beamsville, Ontario. She was the only child of Donald McLean and Alexandra Grant. Donald and Alexandra were married in Scotland in 1911. The McLeans came from farming families and emigrated to Canada to work their own farm. Their endeavor was not successful, nor were their attempts to have a family at first. Alexandra became increasingly bitter and resentful of her husband over the years of their marriage. Don McLean was seven years her senior and a heavy drinker. In fact, he was often drunk, and the more he drank, the more verbally abusive he became. He was prone to violent mood swings and he and his wife would get into loud, ugly arguments. Alexandra McLean was no shrinking violet. She was a domineering woman who held herself with the utmost respectability and felt herself superior to most people who were not as God-fearing and sober as she. So you can imagine what she thought of her drunken husband, the failed farmer. Alexandra was extremely unhappy at not achieving the financial position and social status she felt she was entitled to. She blamed her husband, and the couple's relationship was extremely rocky. Alexandra and Donald McLean would separate a total of seven times over the course of their marriage. This may be another reason that Alexandra's dream of having children took so long to materialize. Their only child, Evelyn, wouldn't be born until Alexandra was 34 years old, which was quite late for that time. Alexandra doted on her pretty dark-haired little girl, Evelyn had a head of black glossy curls, a china doll complexion, and rosebud lips. 
Her mother was extremely proud of her and loved to shower Evelyn with the best of everything, clothes, toys, and anything her heart desired. Evelyn became spoiled as a result. But Alexander considered Evelyn to be delicate and didn't allow her to socialize with other children. Because of this, Evelyn did not develop normal social skills and retreated into a fantasy life. She loved fairy tales where the girl is saved by the handsome prince, and later followed stories in newspapers and magazines of the seemingly charmed lives of Hollywood stars and celebrities. She was sure she was just as special, and like her mother, aspired to the finer things in life. The McLeans moved to Hamilton, Ontario, when Evelyn was just a baby. Hamilton was a town of steel mills and factories located close to the U.S. border. Because of its location, Hamilton had been used for rum running during Prohibition. Evelyn had grown up hearing stories about gangsters, and in fact, there was still a mob presence in the area. Evelyn's father found work in the factories and then was hired as a motorman for the Hamilton Street Railway in 1924. After two years in that position, he was moved into an office job and became assistant to the company's cashier. All the fares collected on the streetcars and buses were locked in a vault in the cashier's office each night. In the morning, the cash was counted. McLean stole the combination of the vault and made a copy of the keys to the cash boxes. He was the first one in every morning and would let himself into the vault where he embezzled cash and coins. Incredibly, no one ever caught on and he continued to embezzle from the HSR for 20 years before he was finally caught. By that time, his total take was estimated to be in the ballpark of $200,000 to $250,000, or between three and four million in Canadian dollars today. Alexandra would later deny knowing anything about her husband's theft from his employer, but it did afford her the resources to provide her daughter a private school education. It also gave her the opportunity to try and buy their way into Hamilton's high society. Alexandra enrolled Evelyn in the prestigious Loretto Academy, a private Catholic school attended by the children of Hamilton's elite. Alexandra hoped that her daughter would be invited to society parties thrown by her classmates' parents and eventually would meet and marry a well-to-do man. But Evelyn was socially awkward and tried much too hard to impress the other girls. They were put off by Evelyn McLean, who took to wearing fur coats over her Catholic school uniform and bestowing lavish gifts on friends who she was only casually acquainted with. As she became a young woman and the invitation still didn't materialize, Evelyn and Alexandra began inviting her classmates to fancy dinners and impromptu parties at expensive hotels. At these parties, Evelyn gave party gifts to the attendees, usually pricey silver compact mirrors for the girls and silver cigarette cases for the boys. She also insisted on picking up the tab at restaurants. She always had cash on her, usually in the form of coins. The way Evelyn tried to buy friends was just too much and reeked of desperation. She was avoided by most of her classmates as a result. Evelyn had grown into a beautiful young woman. She was startlingly attractive and had a knack for fashion. She dressed in the finest clothes, and her parents also purchased a flashy car for her 16th birthday. She stood apart from the crowd as she drove around town in her yellow convertible with leopard pattern seat covers. While high school boys found her a bit strange, men began trying to catch her attention from the time she was about 14 or 15 years old. Evelyn, lonely and increasingly desperate to escape the chaos of her feuding parents, began responding to their overtures. She preferred older men with money who would take her out and wine and dine her at Hamilton's fine restaurants and hotel lounges. She allowed these men to spoil her and buy her gifts, and before long, rumors began to swirl that these were more than just dates. Evelyn McLean, it was rumored, was working as a high-priced escort and maybe even a call girl. But in reality, Evelyn was probably not charging wealthy men for dates, but simply enjoyed being squired around and given expensive gifts. She was getting loads of cash from somewhere, but it's not certain whether it came from her father's stolen loot or the men Evelyn was dating. One clue that she was not sleeping with men for money was the fact that it was Evelyn who commonly offered to lend money to her suitors, not the other way around. But Evelyn certainly did like the attention and especially seemed to enjoy betting the most wealthy and prominent men in town. 
The reason we know this is because it was later discovered she'd kept a black book with details including the names of these men. There were sons of prominent families, lawyers, at least one financier, and a magistrate's son listed among her lovers. Evelyn was most often seen with men who were many years her senior, but she also liked younger, more athletic men as well. When the war began, she was drawn to men in uniform. It was speculated that it was her mother's influence that caused her to date the older, wealthier men, but given a choice, Evelyn preferred her suitors younger and more attractive. It was also believed that Evelyn became pregnant at least twice and had at least one abortion. In 1942, she gave birth to a baby girl that she named Heather Maria. When she gave birth to Heather, she listed herself as Evelyn White on hospital records. Of course, an unmarried woman giving birth was viewed as scandalous in the 1940s, so Evelyn invented a fake husband named Norman White. Norman, she said, was from a wealthy Cleveland family and was in the Navy and away at sea when their daughter was born. Of course, Evelyn had never been married. Not quite a year after Heather's birth, she gave birth to a second child, another girl. The baby was stillborn. Eight months later, Evelyn found out she was pregnant yet again. This time, she told the doctor that the father's name was J.N. White and once again said her husband was on active duty, serving in the Royal Canadian Navy. Evelyn was still living with her parents, who at the time of this pregnancy had reconciled and were living in the same house once again. Evelyn's father, already providing a roof not only for his 24-year-old daughter, but also a two-year-old granddaughter, put his foot down. McLean raged against the situation, telling his wife that Evelyn would not be bringing another fatherless child into his house under any circumstances. Alexandra, as always, took her daughter's side and fought viciously with her husband, but Evelyn decided it was time to get her own place. In August of 1944, Evelyn rented her own apartment. Obviously pregnant, she told the landlord that it would just be her and her two-year-old daughter moving into the unit. She said the doctor had given her the sad news that the baby she was carrying was dead and she was scheduled for a procedure to remove the fetus. She signed a lease to begin on October 1st. On September 4, 1944, Evelyn gave birth to a nine-pound baby boy she named Peter David White. The baby was strong and healthy. While recovering in the hospital, she told the nurses that her husband had been lost at sea, and she was a widow now, with two children to raise. Her mother came to the hospital to visit Evelyn and the baby a week after Peter was born. She brought her daughter and the baby clothes in a large tan suitcase. Evelyn was discharged from the hospital on September 15th. Yes, she was kept in the hospital for 10 days after giving birth. Apparently, that was common then. The doctor had planned to examine her and the baby before she left, but Evelyn said it wasn't necessary and left before he arrived. She took a cab to her mother's home three hours after she was discharged from the hospital. When she entered the house, the baby wasn't with her. Alexander asked where he was, and Evelyn nonchalantly answered that the Children's Aid Society had taken the baby and placed him for adoption. Alexander didn't ask any more questions, and Evelyn didn't bring up the baby again. And why did Evelyn return to her parents' home instead of her own apartment? Well, Evelyn rented the apartment not to live in, but to have a place to entertain her suitors. By this time, her parents were on the skids again, and her father moved out permanently the following spring. Evelyn continued to live with her mother, even sharing the same bed, but spent time at her own apartment when she had a date. Again, Alexandra asked no questions. By that time, Evelyn was the one providing financially for her mother, although she had never held a job. Evelyn met John Dick in August of 1945. By October 1st, he told a friend he was getting married. He said his fiancée was a beautiful girl who had been left a fortune by her now-deceased stockbroker husband. He was ecstatic. For her part, Evelyn didn't share her engagement with anyone, including her mother, until two weeks before the wedding. 
When she found out her daughter was marrying a streetcar operator, Alexandra was furious and refused to attend. Evelyn and John Dick were married on October 4th in front of two friends and two boarders who lived in Dick's rooming house. He was 39, she was 24. So the million dollar question is, why did Evelyn marry John Dick? No one believed it was for love. They hardly seemed to know one another, and Evelyn had never seemed that enthralled with any of the men she dated, many of whom had been more prosperous, younger, and more handsome than John Dick. When asked point blank why she'd married Dick, Evelyn said he was good at helping around the house and, as an HSR employee, could secure things for her that were rationed due to the war, like soap chips and other items. Seems like a pretty thin reason. Some theorized that Evelyn was growing nervous that being an unmarried mother, her daughter Heather, whom she doted on, could be taken away from her. It wasn't unheard of at that time for children born to unwed mothers to be removed from their homes and placed into orphanages. The war had ended, and the my husband is overseas excuse couldn't last much longer. Perhaps she did it to spite her mother? Was she tired of feeling controlled by her mother's insistence she date and marry a wealthy man? Maybe, but Evelyn was also materialistic, and it seems unlikely she'd marry a man of no means and doom her own future. No, it's more likely that Evelyn had been hoisted on her own petard. In other words, she'd fell into her own trap of lies. John Dick told a friend that his bride was a wealthy widow, and he may have thought of her as his ticket to the good life. Meanwhile, Dick had told Evelyn that he and his mother owned shares in the family's successful fruit canning business. He said his shares were worth a fortune, implying he'd be selling some soon after the wedding in order to provide his new wife with the best of everything. The best clue that John Dick was simply a means to an end for Evelyn was that after the I do's had been said, Evelyn returned home to her apartment alone. She told her new husband that her place was too small, her mother had since moved in, and that they'd need to find a house before they could move in together. Stunned and disappointed, Dick returned to his boarding house, not to Evelyn's swanky apartment, located in a refurbished mansion near Hamilton Mountain. If there was a clear indicator that John and Evelyn Dick's marriage was doomed from the start, it was that Evelyn accepted a date from another man just two weeks after her wedding. Bill Bohozik had first seen Evelyn in the summer of 1944. He was immediately attracted to the dark-haired beauty, but he was dating another woman at the time. Bill was 26 years old, 6 feet tall, 220 pounds, and with an athletic build. He was a sharp dresser who drove a newer car. He worked in a factory and took home a decent salary. About a month after meeting Evelyn, Bohozik married a war widow named Helen Mitchell. But within three months, the marriage ended, and Helen packed up and moved to California. Bohozik bumped into Evelyn just days after her wedding. Not bothering to share this news with him, Evelyn agreed to accompany him to a hotel bar to have a drink. She accepted another date with him for the following Sunday. Bohozik picked up both Evelyn and her daughter and took them for a Sunday drive. They stopped at a park where they took turns taking pictures of each other and then together with Heather. On the way home, she told Bohozik that her car had been stolen and she was without transportation. Bohozik quickly offered the use of his car during the day when he was at work and gave her an extra set of car keys. The actual reason that Evelyn was without a car was because her father had become so angry when he discovered she'd married John Dick that he'd taken her car away and locked it up. On October 17th, less than two weeks after Evelyn had married John, she went to Bohozik's home and had sex with him. She still had not told him that she was married, but certainly wasn't hiding the fact that she was seeing Bohozik as they were seen out together in downtown Hamilton. Word soon got back to John Dick that his wife was stepping out on him and had been seen around town driving Bohozik's car. Rather than being angry, Dick was distraught. He found out where Bohozik worked and showed up to confront him. He was almost in tears when he stopped Bohozik in the parking lot to ask him if he'd lent his car to a woman the day before. When Bill said he had, Dick told him that she was his wife. The young man was confused 
and told Dick that if she was, she hadn't told him. Bohozik was embarrassed and said he wouldn't see Evelyn again. Later that day, he retrieved his extra set of car keys from Evelyn and considered the matter settled. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Every Plate. Experience full plates and fuller wallets with America's Best Value Meal Kit. Get meals you'll love that won't empty your bank account delivered right to your door. Every Plate gives you all the ingredients and recipes for a delicious, easy, budget-friendly meal that your whole family will love. You may have thought about trying a meal kit for the convenience and stress-free way to get dinner on the table, but thought it would be too expensive. That's what I love about Every Plate. You get meals that come together in about 30 minutes that are a cheaper alternative to takeout or delivery. I'm so excited to get my first box of Every Plate meals. You can choose your meal kits each week. Listen to some of these yummy sounding dinners gooey stuffed pork burgers with crispy potato wedges, lemon thyme chicken linguine, and fully loaded broccoli potatoes with cheese sauce and crispy bacon. I can't wait to dig into the chili honey butter chicken with zucchini and roasted sweet potatoes. All my favorite things in one delicious meal. And check this out. An every plate meal costs about as much as you pay for one cup of coffee. But I'll go you one even better. By telling them I sent you, you can get three weeks of every plate meals for just $2.99 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering my offer code once three. That's 40% off your first three boxes. That's everyplate.com. And don't forget to use my offer code once and the number three for three weeks of every plate meals for just $2.99 per meal. And thanks for supporting the show. John, Dick, and Evelyn continued to have problems. Dick thought if he could buy his wife a house, she might settle down. But the shares of stock he claimed to own in the family business never materialized. He tried to stall Evelyn by telling her his mother was holding up his shares and he was working on having her release them. Truth was, neither he nor his mother ever had a stake in the business. His only income was a paycheck from the Hamilton Street Railway. Desperate to purchase a home, he asked Evelyn's mother for a loan of $1,200 for a down payment. Alexandra was outraged. Dick had told her just before he wed her daughter that he had $2,500 in the bank, and now he was admitting he had no savings at all. She refused to loan him any money. However, Evelyn Dick was flush with cash. A few weeks after her marriage to Dick, she purchased a house located at 32 Carrick Avenue for $6,300. On October 31st, she moved into the house along with Heather and her mother. When they arrived with the furniture, John Dick was there to greet them. While Evelyn allowed Dick to move in, the situation wasn't as he had envisioned. Evelyn was his wife, and in his mind, that meant whatever she owned belonged to him as well. When he discovered that the mortgage had only been written in Evelyn's name, he demanded she add his name to the paperwork as well. Meanwhile, Dick got to work fixing up the house, making repairs and painting the rooms in the colors Evelyn chose. A couple of weeks later, he again asked about the mortgage papers, and Evelyn ignored him. When she refused to have his name added, he stopped helping out around the house. John Dick began complaining about his marriage to anyone who'd listen. He said he wanted his mother-in-law out of the house and said it should rightfully belong to him. He told people that if Evelyn didn't agree to include him on the deed, he would, quote, give her a hell of a time, unquote. He also shared that his father-in-law had threatened his life. Donald McLean made it very clear that he hated John Dick, who he called a foreigner, although he himself was from another country. Both Donald and Alexander McLean thought Dick was a loser who wasn't good enough for their daughter. Fights between Evelyn and her husband continued to escalate. Evelyn told her mother they fought about women and money, and Alexandra heard Dick demanding $100 from Evelyn or he'd, quote, slit her throat, unquote. Dick started staying away from his home more, and while Evelyn told her mother that he was out with other women, his cousin's wife, Ann Kammerer, said he had been staying at their home off and on when he and Evelyn were on the outs. By February 3rd, John Dick left Evelyn's home on Carrick Avenue for good. 
he moved in with his cousin Alex and his wife Anne. Although whenever he wasn't working, he continued to follow Evelyn, spying on her. But there was one fatal mistake John Dick made that would set things in motion to seal his fate. During their very brief marriage, Evelyn had confided in him about her father's theft from the Hamilton Street Railway, the same company that employed Dick. Donald McLean had confronted John Dick, calling him a freeloader who'd taken advantage of his daughter. During this argument, Dick angrily countered by calling McLean a lousy thief and told him he knew all about the money he'd embezzled. McLean became enraged and threatened to shoot his son-in-law. Dick took the threat seriously and reported it to the Hamilton police. The inspectors investigating John Dick's murder heard all these stories about the bad blood and animosity between John Dick, his wife, and her parents. They decided to have a chat with Mrs. Evelyn Dick. On March 4th, John Dick was scheduled to work, but called in sick. He was still convinced that Evelyn was seeing Bill Bohosik, and it was believed he'd taken the day off to try and catch them together. That same day, Dick called his mother-in-law to ask her for a small loan. He was given a cash bank from his employer to make change with while driving his streetcar route, usually in the amount of $75 to $100. Dick had been seen in hotel bars drinking heavily, and it seems that he used that cash to pay his bar tabs. The loan he asked Mrs. McLean for was to make up the amount he was short from his cash bank. Alexandra had covered the shortage for Dick before, but on that day she refused, and he went away empty-handed. That was the last day she would ever hear from her son-in-law. The next day was Ash Wednesday, and John Dick did not show up for work. Ten days later, Dick's employer would report him missing. The following account is the timeline of events from the day John Dick went missing until Evelyn Dick was brought into the police station for questioning. On Tuesday, March 6, Evelyn showed up at Bill Landig's auto repair shop to borrow a car. Landig was an acquaintance of her father's and had given Evelyn the use of his black 1938 Packard sedan several times that month already. That day, she arrived at the garage at 2 p.m. to pick up the keys, promising to return the car by 5. At a little after 2 p.m., John Dick was observed eating a late lunch at the Windsor Hotel dining room in Hamilton. It was the last place he'd be seen. Around 6 p.m. that evening, Evelyn returned home to Carrick Avenue and asked her mother for the key to their garage, telling her she was going to park the Packard inside. Her mother said it would never fit, It was too big, and the garage was full of junk. Evelyn told her to, quote, mind her own business, unquote. Alexandra watched as Evelyn repeatedly tried to fit the Packard in the garage with no luck. She finally gave up and drove off. Evelyn returned the car late, at 7.30 p.m., to Bill Landeg's garage. He'd already gone home for the night, so she left a note with the keys. She apologized, saying that her daughter had cut her face and had bled on the car seat covers. She'd taken the stained covers off and promised to replace them. Two days later, Alexandra commented to Evelyn that she hadn't seen John Dick operating his streetcar in the last few days. Evelyn told her she'd, quote, never see him on a streetcar again, and it's not likely he'll bother me again, unquote. When her mother asked her to explain, Evelyn responded, shut your damn mouth and keep your nose out of my business. The next Tuesday, Evelyn visited the Central Police Station to ask if John Dick had been arrested. Asked why he might have been arrested, Mrs. Dick said that he was suspected of running away with tickets and money belonging to the Hamilton Street Railway. When the officer said he had no record of John Dick being arrested, she thanked him and left. Four days after that, John Dick's torso was discovered on Hamilton Mountain.
Investigators believed Evelyn Dick might have some information about her husband's demise and went to her house with a search warrant on March 19th. When they arrived, they found her home and both of her parents were there as well. She told officers she hadn't seen John Dick since March 4th. They told her they were very sorry to inform her that her husband was dead. The story about the torso discovery had been prominently featured in the papers for the last three days. The Reed and Weaver children who'd made the discovery had become instant celebrities and had their pictures printed on the front page. Investigators now dropped the bombshell that the torso belonged to John Dick. Without hesitation or emotion, Evelyn responded, Don't look at me. I don't know anything about it. They told her they had a search warrant for her home, and she would be taken downtown to be interviewed while that was being conducted. She went with the officers without complaint. Once arriving at the station, Evelyn agreed to be questioned without her parents or an attorney present. They started by asking her when she'd last seen her husband. That was all they had to say before Evelyn began spilling her guts. But not out of guilt or remorse, but simply in a just-the-facts sort of way. Evelyn said she'd last seen John Dick on March 4th at the Astor Hotel. She had been unable to reach him for several days, and when he saw her, he became angry and told her to leave. She left him drinking at the bar and claimed it was the last time she'd been in his presence. She then explained to the cops that her husband had been, quote, running around with women, unquote, and had broken up at least one marriage. She said one of these women had a husband who'd found out and was looking for John Dick. That was what she was trying to warn him about when he told her to get lost the last day she'd seen him. But Evelyn Dick continued to talk, weaving a story too ridiculous to be believed. In December, she said, a well-dressed man in an expensive suit came to her house looking for her husband. He said Dick had been seeing his wife, and he was there to straighten matters out. She told him her husband wasn't home, and the man left. On March 6th, Evelyn received a call from a man she claimed was a member of a gang from Windsor who said they'd caught up with her husband. The man directed her to drive to a place on the outskirts of town. This is why she'd borrowed the Packard from Bill Landig, Evelyn explained. When she'd arrived at the deserted road where she'd been sent, there were at least two men sitting inside a black Oldsmobile. They directed her to stop the car on the side of the road. Afterward, one man dragged a heavy sack to her car, opened the passenger door, and pushed it over the front seat, depositing it in the back. He told her that, quote, part of John was in the sack. The man then got in the car and directed her to drive up Hamilton Mountain toward Albion Falls. He told her where to stop and then got out and rolled the package down an embankment. He then instructed her to drive him back to town and drop him at the Connaught Hotel. As soon as the detectives stopped scratching their heads in wonder, they asked, why on earth, if they were already in a car with the body, did they have her drive them to dispose of it? She told a story about how the gang was short a car because they were on their way to pick up a big shipment of liquor. That still didn't answer why they called her to take them to dispose of the body when they could have just done it themselves quicker and with one fewer witness. She shrugged her shoulders and explained that they had something else to do. They'd heard just about enough by that point and decided to arrest Mrs. Dick, but they had one more question. They'd seen no emotion at all from the woman whose husband had been murdered and cut into pieces. Just how did she feel about John being murdered? I just can't express how I feel, Evelyn answered. Then she threw some shade at her husband by mentioning the supposed affair with the gangster's wife, who she now also said he'd impregnated. But, I mean, it was a pretty mean trick to break up a home, she said. Now they asked her straight out, Mrs. Dick, did you have any actual part in the murder of your husband? No, she answered. I know nothing about where his legs, arms, or hands are. Evelyn Dick was arrested and held on a charge of vagrancy. At the time, this was a catch-all charge that simply allowed the police to hold a suspect in custody while the case was being investigated. She was denied bail and remanded into the Barton Street Jail until March 27th. Bill Bohosik was brought in for questioning the next day. 
Once Evelyn heard that Bohozik had been interviewed, she told investigators that she needed to add some more information to her previous statement. She now implicated Bill Bohozik in the murder of her husband. She said that Bill hated her husband and wanted to get even with Dick for telling everyone he was running around with his wife. She said Bill had asked her for a $200 loan for a down payment to, quote, have John fixed, unquote, by the gangsters from Windsor. Evelyn actually had loaned Bohozik $200, but it was for the repair of his car. He'd paid her back two weeks later. She said that the gangster she'd driven up the mountain, whom she now named Romanelli, told her how the murder had unfolded. On March 5th, he and an accomplice found Dick at the King George Hotel and began drinking with him. They got him drunk, and he agreed to ride with them up the mountain to continue drinking. Once they were on a deserted road, one of the men shot Dick, who was in the passenger seat, in the back of the neck. She said the gangsters then drove to a house and cut up the body. Romanelli had told her that Bohozik was also paying him to dispose of the body. Investigators asked her where the rest of Dick's body was, and she said, I understand the limbs were burned in a furnace. Meanwhile, a search was being conducted at the Carrick Street house. In the basement, a basket with what appeared to be bloodstains on it was found full of ashes. As they sifted through the ashes, they found pieces of bone. There were also ashes found in ruts in Evelyn's dirt driveway. Within those ashes, they found a stump of a tooth and more bone fragments. The ashes were taken to the morgue and carefully sifted through, revealing seven teeth and many pieces of bone. Dr. Dedman identified the fragments as belonging to leg, thigh, and skull bones. The blood on the basket was found to be type O, the same as John Dix. But that wasn't the end of what they would find. Other dark secrets of Evelyn Dix would soon be revealed. On Friday, March 22nd, another search of Evelyn Dick's house was conducted. This time, the attic was searched. There, investigators found a locked, tan-colored suitcase. Alexandra said it was the one her daughter had brought home with her from the hospital after the birth of her last baby. But the key had been lost. Police officers pried open the suitcase, releasing a foul odor from inside. They observed a burlap bag, inside of which was a small wicker basket. Inside the basket was a cement-filled cardboard box. There was a piece of cloth poking out of the cement. The entire bundle was transported to the morgue, where Dr. Dedman carefully chipped the cement away. Underneath, he discovered a zippered shopping bag wrapped in a brown skirt. The inside band of the skirt had Evelyn's name written on it. Inside the shopping bag, to their horror, they discovered the partially mummified body of a newborn baby. The baby had been doubled up and put inside the shopping bag. The baby, discovered to be a boy, was still wearing a cloth diaper, held together by two now rusted safety pins. He had been dressed in a lace gown with a knitted sweater over it. A knotted piece of thick string was looped around the newborn's neck. Evelyn was interviewed for a third time. Investigators told her about the discovery of the ashes in her furnace. Once again, she told them she'd spill the entire story. This time, Bill Bohozik was implicated further. Evelyn claimed that Dick had caught her having sex with Bill Bohozik on October 9th, five days after Dick and Evelyn's wedding. Later, even after she told Dick she was no longer seeing Bill, he didn't believe her. Months passed, and on March 4th, Dick accused her of being pregnant with Bohozik's baby. Two days later, Evelyn witnessed her husband leaving the King George Hotel with Romanelli and another man. Later that day, Evelyn said Bill called her to say, we've got him at last. Bill told her to meet him at the Royal Connaught Hotel. When she arrived, Romanelli was there. He handed her a box with her husband's watch inside. He said Bill wanted her to have it. She was driving Landig's Packard at that time, and Romanelli said he needed it. She didn't want to, but she lent it to him, and he took her home before driving away in the Packard. When Romanelli returned the car, 
Evelyn noticed a lot of blood in it. She also said she found a blanket covered in blood inside, as well as part of the face wrapped in a cloth. Romanelli told her that these were parts of the body that, quote, would not burn, unquote. Evelyn said she put these parts in her garage in a bushel basket. She then drove Romanelli back to the hotel and returned the car. That's when she admitted to her mother that John Dick had been fixed. She claimed that her mother knew Bill Bohozik had wanted to get revenge on her husband for some time. They were just about to ask her to admit to burning the rest of the body in her furnace when they received a call reporting that the body of a newborn baby boy had been found in Evelyn's attic. Every time more evidence was discovered to implicate Evelyn Dick in a crime, rather than denying the allegations, she added, subtracted, and inserted more information into the stories she told police. Now faced with the discovery of her dead baby, Evelyn admitted that she'd given birth to the boy in September of 1944. He was Bill's baby, she said, and was the spitting image of him. Evelyn claimed that immediately after she left the hospital with the baby, Bill told her to meet him in a hotel parking lot. She got into his car holding the baby, and Bill took him from her. I'll get rid of the little bastard, she quoted Bohozik as saying, and then strangled the baby by knotting a blanket around his neck. He then put the baby's body in a zippered bag. Evelyn claimed she didn't know anything else about the baby until 18 months later, when Bill handed her a cemented cardboard box with the baby's remains. She said the cement started to crumble, so she grabbed a garment, her skirt, and wrapped it around the box. She then poured more cement over it to hold it into place and put the bundle in her attic. Evelyn's attorney finally arrived and told her to stop talking. By this time, however, Evelyn had confessed to almost everything, except taking part in murdering anyone. But it was clear she had not made much effort in trying to conceal any evidence either. Evelyn was formally charged with John Dick's murder on March 26. Through her attorney, she now said that only the third interview she gave police was true. She was remanded into custody until April 10th. On March 29th, Bill Bohozik was shocked to discover that he was being charged with the murder of Evelyn's baby boy. She was also charged with that murder on the same day. Bill was taken into custody. But Evelyn wasn't through throwing people under the bus yet. On April 12th, she asked investigators, quote, when are you going to bring the old man in? He's in it, unquote, meaning her father, Donald McLean. Evelyn said her father was the one who loaned Bill the gun. She said he also wanted Dick dead because he was afraid he'd rat him out about stealing from the company. Evelyn's story changed once again. Now there was no Romanelli, and Evelyn put herself right at the scene of the murder. After her father loaned Bill the gun, they had tested it in the basement of McLean's home, located at 214 Rosalind Avenue. McLean's house had already been searched, where investigators had found a gun, $4,400 in cash, and thousands of stolen streetcar tickets. Without cancellation marks, the tickets were worth the value of new tickets and could be used or sold. The search uncovered thousands of them stuffed into bags and boxes and hidden throughout the house. The combination to the Hamilton Street Railway office vault was also found written on a piece of paper in McLean's home. They also confiscated a butcher knife and a small saw, along with a Detective Stories magazine outlining a case of a dismembered body burned in a furnace. Donald McLean was arrested for theft and taken into custody. Back to Evelyn's statement. On March 6th, Evelyn now confessed that she had met her estranged husband at the hotel bar ostensibly to talk things over, but the bar was closed. She suggested they pick up some liquor and go somewhere for a drink. Then Evelyn said, hold your hat. She and Dick met up with Bill Bohozik, and all three went together for a drive up Hamilton Mountain. What? They stopped and had some drinks together, said Evelyn. She continued driving, and Dick drank more, becoming very intoxicated. Bill was sitting in the back seat when she stopped the car near Albion Falls. It was there that Bill shot Dick in the neck twice, just below the hairline. Evelyn said Bill then wrapped a blanket found in the car around Dick's head. But Dick groaned, indicating that he wasn't dead so Bill shot him once more in the chest. 
They then drove the Packard to Evelyn's house and put the body in the garage. Dropping Bill back downtown, Evelyn then cleaned up the car as best she could and returned it to Bill Landig's garage. Bill was tasked with coming back to dispose of the body. He cut up the body in the garage and burned parts of it in her furnace and other parts in the furnace at her father's house. Believing the whole family to be involved in the murder of John Dick, police also arrested Alexandra McLean and held her on a vagrancy charge. Little Heather, now four years old, was placed into temporary foster care. The media had a field day with the story of the Torso Murder, reporting daily on every salacious aspect of the case in the newspapers. Photographers clamored for a shot of Evelyn Dick as she was taken from the Barton Street Jail into court. She loved all the attention. Finally, she was getting the recognition she'd craved her entire life. When cameras were pointed her way, she played up to them, often saying, Make it a good one, boys. She couldn't wait to read how she was described in the papers and even enlisted another female convict to set her hair each day so she'd look her best. The story became even more scandalous when the discovery of the baby's corpse was reported on March 25th. The headline that day in the Toronto Daily Star read, Find Dead Baby in Torso Case. Evelyn Dick was now Canada's most infamous accused murderess. The crime story held the public in thrall. Here was the story of a beautiful, sexually promiscuous young woman who was an admitted adulterer. She was accused of one of the most gruesome crimes on record. Yet she showed no emotion about the dismemberment of her husband. She flirted with reporters, photographers, and even police officers and reveled in the attention. Information was leaked to the press about Evelyn's little black book filled with the names of lovers, including some of Hamilton's most prominent men. She was called a nymphomaniac by gossips, and one particularly crude comment made by a court reporter was repeated around town. About Evelyn Dick, Sid Hibbs was quoted as saying, she only f***ed her friends, and she had no enemies. The court found insufficient evidence to hold Alexander McLean on murder, but she was held as material witness and freed on $4,000 bond. Evelyn Dick's trial for the murder of John Dick began on October 7, 1946. Evelyn spent six months in jail awaiting trial. It was common knowledge that Evelyn was crazy for chocolate, and admirers sent chocolate bars and other goodies to the jail. As a result of all these gifts, by the time her trial began, she was a bit plumper than when she'd first been arrested. The prosecutor laid out the court's case, which included Evelyn's relationship with Bill Bohosik. John Dick strained relationships with Evelyn, Bohosik, and Donald McLean, the blood and other evidence found in the Packard, the ashes and bone fragments found in Evelyn's basement and in her father's home, the evidence of Don McLean's theft from his employer, and John Dick's knowledge of the embezzlement, and finally, all of Evelyn's own statements to the police. The star witness for the prosecution was Evelyn's own mother. Alexandra McLean testified truthfully, not only because she was a God-fearing, straight-talking woman, but because she'd been threatened with jail herself should she perjure herself on the stand. She truthfully testified to her daughter's admission that it was unlikely John Dick would trouble her again. Upon questioning under oath, Alexandra stated that she'd pressed her for more information, asking, Nothing's happened to him? He's not been killed? To which Evelyn answered, Yes, John Dick is dead, and you keep your mouth shut. The defense called no witnesses, but instead claimed that Evelyn's statements had been coerced. They said she'd been enticed by the promise of chocolate bars to speak to the investigators. On October 15th, the prosecution rested its case. The defense was laid out in the closing arguments, pointing out that there was absolutely no evidence that Evelyn Dick had murdered John Dick. If anything, she was only an accessory after the fact by helping to dispose of the body, her attorney said. He pointed the finger squarely at Bill Bohosik. On October 17th, the jury came back with a verdict of guilty and a recommendation of mercy. The judge handed down his sentence. Evelyn Dick was sentenced to be hanged in three months' time on January 7th. She still displayed no emotion.
The wheels of justice turned a lot faster in 1946. The day after Evelyn Dick was sentenced to death, Bill Bohosik and Donald McLean were tried together for the murder of John Dick. Evelyn was the first and probably only witness called to testify, but she refused to be sworn in. Without their star witness, the Crown had no case. They tried again the next day, but Evelyn still refused to testify. Bohosik's attorney took the opportunity to point out that there was absolutely no evidence tying his client to the murder. He further told the judge that Bohosik had asked repeatedly to be given a lie detector test. The court allowed Bohosik and McLean to be held in custody until Evelyn's appeal was filed and heard by the court. On January 9th, the court heard Evelyn's appeal. Her execution date had been set for the same week, so she was given a one-month reprieve. Evelyn's new lawyer was J.J. Robinette, and this appeal hearing earned him a reputation as a superstar attorney. Robinette argued that Evelyn's statements to the police were not legally admissible. First of all, Robinette said, they were made involuntarily. She was prodded by the police, and their questions were leading and coerced. Why else would she change her story so frequently, he asked. But his most successful argument was directed at the charge that had been used to hold her while the case was being investigated. Evelyn had been charged with vagrancy, not murder. She was not under arrest, but merely detained, and under a false charge. Any statements made while she was being illegally detained had to be ruled inadmissible. He further argued that the jury was given improper instructions before finding her guilty. They should have been instructed that if a reasonable doubt existed in the jury's minds, whether she was an accessory before or after the fact, she must be acquitted of the charge of murder. Robinette filed the appeal to ask that a new trial be given to his client, but seeing that his arguments were making an impact on the court, decided to ask for an outright acquittal. On January 17th, the appeals court unanimously set aside Evelyn Dick's murder conviction, and she was awarded a new trial. Her new trial was set for February 24, 1947. Before her second trial, Evelyn went on a crash diet and shed the 20 pounds she had gained while sitting on death row. Her statements to police would not be allowed into evidence at her new trial. Alexandra McLean was called as a witness once again, but this time her testimony changed just a bit. Now Evelyn's mother testified that her daughter didn't say that John Dick was dead, but only that he, quote, wouldn't bother her again, unquote. This time the jury took five hours to reach its decision. For the first time, Evelyn seemed to be nervous and sat at the end of her seat waiting for their verdict to be announced. They found her not guilty. Afterward, her mother was quoted in the press saying, That's the power of prayer. We're Anglicans, and we believe in the power of prayer. The date of her acquittal landed exactly one year since the murder of John Dick, March 7th. Evelyn still faced another trial. She and Bohozik were being charged in the death of baby Peter. Before the trial began on March 24th, Bohozik and Evelyn's father were both finally released on bond. Robinette was not as confident he could win an acquittal for his client on this charge. He thought the best he could do would be to get Evelyn's charges reduced to manslaughter. The infamous suitcase the baby was found inside was brought into court. Evelyn's doctor testified that the baby was born healthy on September 5, 1944, and was not seen alive after leaving the hospital with his mother. Alexandra was compelled to testify again. She told the court that Evelyn had told her the baby had been taken by the Children's Aid Society. She also told the court that she believed her daughter was married to a Mr. White, which is almost certainly untrue. She also confirmed that Evelyn's father had not wanted another baby in the house, and she'd fought with him over this. Dr. Dedman testified that the baby was most likely strangled with the cord found around his neck. Under cross-examination, he admitted he couldn't be certain of this due to the advanced state of decomposition. The defense presented Evelyn Dick as a loving mother who'd taken good care of her living child, Heather, and had prepared for the birth of her baby boy by seeing her doctor regularly during her pregnancy, purchasing clothes, a bassinet, and other items the child would need, and preparing a room for the baby in advance. In his closing statement, Robinette said that his client was being judged unfairly, not because there was evidence that she had murdered her baby, but because of the life she led. 
As for who had killed the baby, Robinette pointed to Evelyn's father. It was he who didn't want this baby brought to his home, and the cement trowel was found at his home, not Evelyn's. Before the jury was to make its decision, the judge decided that they could fine for manslaughter or murder. The charge of murder would carry the death penalty. The jury came back a few hours later, finding Evelyn Dick guilty of manslaughter. The judge sentenced her to the maximum sentence allowed. She would spend the rest of her natural life in prison. Evelyn Dick was given a life sentence, not for the murder and dismemberment of her husband, but for the manslaughter of her newborn son in 1944. She was very happy to be leaving the cold and dark Barton Street Jail for the women's prison in Kingston. Bill Bohosik and Don McLean's trial began immediately after Evelyn's wrapped up. Bohosik's responsibility for the death of the baby was considered first. It was easily decided, as he had not even met Evelyn until October of 1945, 13 months after her baby boy was born. It took the jury just 23 minutes to find him not guilty. He was back in court the next week to face charges for the murder of John Dick. Evelyn was called as the first witness and once again refused to be sworn. She was already serving a life sentence, so there was nothing to compel her to testify. Then a credible witness came forward to say, that Bill Bohosik could not have been on Hamilton Mountain carrying out a murder on March 6th because he had witnessed him in town flirting with a ticket seller at the theater box office, which was confirmed by the young woman. The prosecutors brought no evidence against him, and the judge instructed the jury to acquit Bohosik immediately. They did. Before Bohosik's release, the judge addressed him, saying, This has been a costly lesson to you and should make you careful of the company you keep in the future. A man is known by the company he keeps. Bill Bohosik agreed and followed the judge's advice for the rest of his life. Donald McLean's trial began immediately after Bill's. The Crown presented the evidence found at his Rosslyn Avenue home, but they had no direct evidence that he had murdered John Dick. The following day, a deal was struck. The Crown announced it would provide no further evidence to the court, and the judge ordered the jury to find McLean not guilty for lack of evidence. In turn, McLean agreed to plead guilty to the crime of accessory after the fact. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Another five years was added to run concurrently for the embezzlement from the Hamilton Street Railway. McLean served a total of four years and was released in 1951. Evelyn's story doesn't end just quite yet. She began her life sentence in 1947, and Robinette filed an appeal of her sentence, but lost. Evelyn was a good prisoner, always well-behaved, polite, and she used her intelligence to help and mentor others. However, she still behaved in a superior way towards other prisoners and still used manipulation and charm to get what she wanted. She was able to befriend prison staff and administrators alike and use them for her own purposes. In the 1950s, Canada's prison system employed a Ticket of Leave program, where prisoners could earn their way to a shorter sentence. Evelyn Dick filed a request for an early leave in 1955, but was denied. She was granted leave three years later and walked out of prison on November 10, 1958, having served just 11 and a half years of her life sentence. The following year, the Ticket of Leave program was dissolved. Subsequently, Prisoners had to go before a parole board and have their records reviewed before being eligible for parole. Evelyn Dick made it out just in time. Because her case had gained so much notoriety, Evelyn was provided with a new identity and allowed to move out of the area after her release. She never returned to Hamilton again, and only a couple of prison administrators knew her new name or where she settled afterward. In 1985, at the age of 65, Evelyn Dick was granted a pardon by the federal government, which meant she no longer had to report to police or a parole board, and her record was now permanently sealed. Do I know where she ended up? Why, yes, I do. But if you want to hear the rest of her story, you'll have to jump on over to Patreon. I was going to include it all on this episode, but we've gone long this time. Not to worry, though. I won't completely leave you hanging. 
Here's the where are they now for some of the others in this case. Like I mentioned, Evelyn's father, Donald McLean, was released from prison in 1951. He was 73 years old. If you can believe the nerve, he actually wrote a letter to the Hamilton Street Railway asking for a job, the same company that he stole a quarter of a million dollars from. Of course, they took a pass. He lived his final years in a rooming house supported by his pension and part-time work as a parking lot attendant. He died in 1955 at the age of 77. Evelyn's daughter, Heather, was raised in Hamilton by her grandmother, Alexandra McLean. She began using her middle name and was thereafter known as Maria McLean. In 1958, at the age of 17, she married a factory worker. She had a daughter of her own in 1960. She was divorced in 1967, and she and her daughter moved to Toronto. Upon her death, her grandmother left her an estate worth $11,000. Alexandra McLean died in 1964. There was a rumor that Evelyn would be attending her mother's funeral. She did not. Bill Bohosik continued living in Hamilton and working for his same employer who never believed he was guilty of murder. He married in 1952 and had a son and a daughter. He changed his name for his wife and children's sake. He and his wife were married for 44 years. He died in 1996. And the songs... Well, there's two of note. The first song inspired by the torso murder was a schoolyard song used to skip rope to, much like the Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her father 40 wax variety. But this one was a bit naughtier. I had to read it a few times before I got the joke. It's much easier to hear when said out loud. To put it into context, though, you have to know something kind of weird. This detail was learned by the public during Evelyn's first trial, when Dr. Dedman testified regarding the postmortem examination. John Dick's body was missing all but one appendage. The one that sounds like his name? Okay, so here are the lyrics to this little ditty sung by schoolchildren. You cut off his legs, you cut off his arms, you cut off his head. How could you, Mrs. Dick? How could you, Mrs. Dick? The story of the infamous Evelyn Dick has been shared a variety of ways over the years. In 1974, a book titled Torso, penned by crime writer Marjorie Freeman Campbell, was released. In 1982, CBC's radio program titled Scales of Justice aired the drama How Could You, Mrs. Dick? It was later staged as a play with the same title. In 1989, a second song about Evelyn Dick, released by the band The Forgotten Rebels on their untitled album, gained popularity. The lyrics go something like this. Evelyn was a party girl from Hamilton South. Her hubby drove a bus around the Gore Park Fountain. Then one day they had a terrible fight. You should have seen what happened that night. She took the saw and cut off his arms, took the saw and cut off his legs, took the saw and cut off his head. Why did you do it, Mrs. Evelyn Dick? How could you, Mrs. Dick? The words become more graphic from there. Like all the songs I've mentioned in the series Swan Songs, you can find a link to listen in the show notes. I'll just share one more resource with you. I found a lot of the details for this story in the book, The Torso Murder, The Untold Story of Evelyn Dick, written by Brian Valley. There are even more details that I'll be adding as a bonus on Patreon. In that bonus episode, I'll share with you what happened to Evelyn Dick after she was released from prison, the results of the psychological examination of Evelyn Dick before she was handed down her life sentence, and why the judge decided to give her the maximum sentence. Finally. I'll share author Brian Valley's theory of who actually murdered John Dick and who else took part in this crime. I'll also add in my own two cents about the parts of that theory I agree with and a bit of my own interpretation of the facts. Phew, that'll just about do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. To become a Patreon member and get lots more bonus content, ad-free episodes, and a prize pack of goodies sent to you, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to join for as little as $2 per month. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. And original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Thanks for listening and telling a friend. Until next time, be good to one another.